Jared Isaacman, the new NASA administrator. He was confirmed late last week after being renominated in November. And Administrator Isaacman, I have been looking forward to having this conversation with you for the better part of a year, so welcome. And it's great to welcome you as the new administrator of NASA. Oh, thanks for having me, Morgan. And uh, I hope you and your family had a wonderful time over the holidays. Merry Christmas. You too. Okay, you hit the ground running. You were confirmed last week. Same day, the president signs this sweeping executive order uh, regarding space. So how does that now lay out the roadmap for NASA moving forward? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what an exciting start um, as administrator of NASA. I mean, it's been a week. We've been going near 24-7, uh, and we have the president's national space policy as guidance. Um, I think it's probably the most significant commitment to American leadership in space since the Kennedy era reaffirms our commitment to return to the moon and establish the infrastructure uh, so that we can maintain an enduring presence, basically saying, let's build the moon base. And then from there, we're going to start making investments in nuclear power in space, nuclear propulsion, so we can make that next giant leap uh, in human space exploration and discovery. So extraordinarily exciting time right now at NASA. Yeah. Why is the moon so important and why is it so important to start building out infrastructure there to basically stay there? It's a really good question. First, I'd say it's uh, fulfilling a promise that uh, presidents have made for 35 years. Uh, the American taxpayers have spent over $100 billion uh, to um, uh, enable America's return to the moon. The president appreciated this position uh, during his first term when he created the Artemis program and said America should return to the moon and then again recommitted us to it now. Uh, which we will achieve uh, during his term, and then, uh, of course, establishing the infrastructure so when we get there, we can stay. And why is that important? Because we want to uh, have that opportunity to realize, um, to explore and realize the scientific, economic, and national security potential on the moon. Uh, we haven't been there in an awful long time. Uh, there are certainly a lot of applications. You reference uh, leading up to the, the show, the commercial space industry. You have commercial space companies looking to mine on the moon, potentially extract helium-3. It could be a more efficient source of uh, a fusion power someday in the future. This is something we don't want to get wrong. Yeah. So all of this raises the questions. Does the NASA budget enable this? And how is partnering and maybe perhaps thinking differently about contracting with commercial space companies going to enable this? Well, I think the taxpayers entrust NASA with an extraordinary budget. Um, in fact, I, even if you look at the continuing resolution that we've been operating under this year, plus the investments uh, authorized under um, the Working Family Tax Credit Act, uh, formerly known as the One Big Beautiful Bill, NASA has a, uh, a substantial uh, budget available. I mean, you know, even if you adjust for inflation, NASA's uh, annual budget is comparable to what, uh, you know, the, the country spent during the entirety of the Manhattan Project. We can do some pretty extraordinary things, um, you know, with those, those resources that are available. I think we can return to the moon. We can establish the infrastructure there. We can make investments into the next giant leap capabilities like nuclear, and we can make investments into our, into our science portfolio as well, so we can endeavor to unlock uh, the secrets of the universe. I've heard this framed as a space race against China, uh, which is also looking to put boots on the moon, I think, by the end of this decade. Um, but Tori Bruno, who up until just a couple of days ago was running United Launch Alliance, said to me, and is now going to be president at Blue Origin, said to me earlier this month, he thinks we're actually in a cold war and people just don't even realize it yet. How do you see this? Well, I think the, the president certainly appreciates um, the importance, uh, the national security importance of space. I mean, he created the Space Force during, uh, during his first term. The, the high ground has always mattered, uh, you know, since the beginning of human history. And space is no different than that. It's the ever-expanding high ground. What was important to us in low Earth orbit decades ago has moved to medium orbit, high Earth orbit, and now to the moon uh, and beyond. So I think it's, it's vitally important. Uh, competition is a good thing, by the way. Um, you know, we, uh, it's, it's a good thing amongst our, our various commercial partners and our international partners that are contributing this grand endeavor. When we go to the moon, we never go alone. Uh, but it's also, I think, important from a geopolitical perspective. Uh, America needs to return to the moon. We need to establish the infrastructure there, and then we need to set our sights even higher. Speaking of competition, and I realize we've got Artemis II coming in in the coming weeks or coming months here, and then Artemis III behind it and by 2028. But longer term, what does it mean for things like Boeing's SLS rocket and Lockheed Martin made Orion space capsule? Well, I, I'd say first and foremost, you know, the, the SLS architecture that supports Artemis, um, you know, is authorized through uh, Artemis V, again, under the Working Family Tax Credit Act and one big beautiful bill. Uh, so we've got our architecture 
to get us around the moon, which will be coming in the very near future. I mean, we're talking weeks, months away under the Artemis II program. We are going to follow that up with Artemis III, where American astronauts will return to the surface of the moon, and then we have additional vehicles thereafter. Now, in order to actually land astronauts on the moon, it means our partners along the way, our commercial partners, SpaceX and Blue Origin are the two that are under contract, will have uh, perfected rapid reusability of heavy lift launch vehicles, on-orbit uh, cryogenic prop transfer, and that's going to be a game changer. That's going to, that's what's going to enable us to, to be able to go to and from the moon affordably with great frequency and set up for missions to Mars and beyond. So we, we've got a, a, a great lineup of vendors right now uh, that are critical to achieving our near-term objectives. Uh, and then we have commercial space industry that's going to be able to partner with us as we make our operations to and from the moon uh, routine. Yeah, speaking of competition, is there enough competition right now ready to go in launch? Oh, this is this is it's a great question. This is this is the healthiest launch market we've ever seen in, in the history of America's space program. Uh, you know, a lot of people certainly talk about SpaceX, which they've done absolutely extraordinary things with the reusability they've been demonstrating almost 500 times over the last 10 years. But you have Blue Origin that uh, just had a very successful New Glenn launch where they were able to recover their heavy lift launch booster. You got companies like Stoke that are uh, investing in rapid reusability, Rocket Lab, Firefly. I mean, these were names that were on your board not that long ago. Of course, you still have, you know, you have the ULA that's contributing in this. So th this is the most competitive, healthiest launch industry we've had, which is key for America's uh, exploration objectives in space. It's key to unlocking the orbital economy. And it's key to increasing the rate of world-changing discovery, getting more scientific missions out there. Moon, Mars, planetary science, uh, heliophysics, studying the sun, Earth observation. I mean, low-cost launch in a competitive environment is, is key to enabling the entire NASA mission. Yeah, speaking of SpaceX, We've got a possible IPO, history-making IPO in the cards for next year, possibly as someone who not only flew to historic space missions with SpaceX as a private citizen in the past, but who is, I assume, as NASA administrator, also tracking all the private capital coming into this sector. How do you see that milestone? Oh, there, there's a lot we can talk about here. Uh, you know, first and foremost, you know, NASA achieved some extraordinary things during the 1960s. We sent American astronauts to the moon. We brought them back safely at a time when we knew very little about space. It was not inexpensive. The discre you know, NASA's discretionary, you know, received four and a half percent of the discretionary budget in the 1960s. We're a fraction of that now uh, today, but we're still able to do incredible things because we have partners out there. They're investing substantial amount of their either personal resources or private capital into capabilities for the benefit of certainly uh, the competitiveness of the nation, but for people the world over. Uh, so we're very grateful for what uh, what SpaceX is able to do, the resources they're putting into Starship program, what uh, what Jeff Bezos and the Blue Origin team are putting into to New Glenn. It's an exciting time because we have folks other than the taxpayers contributing to you know NASA's extraordinary objectives across the last frontier. What are your thoughts on data centers in space, especially given the fact that we've seen the commercialization of low Earth orbit in part but from previous NASA policy? Okay, so I love this. Um, establishing an orbital economy is key. You know, I've, I've had a chance to meet with President Trump many times. Uh, this is captured in the national space policy. We're completely aligned, aligned around this. Number one priority, American leadership in the high ground of space. We've got to return to the moon, establish the enduring presence, realize scientific, economic, and national security value. We've got to make investments in nuclear spaceships, bring nuclear power to space so we can set up for that next giant leap to Mars and beyond. Number two, we need the orbital economy. And that's specifically called out in the national space policy. We all envision a future someday with lots of lots of space stations and uh, and mining and commercial operations on the moon and now post on Mars. It's not going to happen if it's perpetually funded by the taxpayers. We need to unlock that orbital economy, whether it's data centers in space, if it's biotech, we're going to or, or, or cancer treating drug formulations or, or mining helium three on the moon. Whatever it is, we need it. That's what's going to fund that exciting future. And number three, increase the rate of world changing discoveries. We all love Hubble and James Webb Telescope and rovers on Mars. We just need a lot more of them with greater frequency so we can unlock the secrets of the universe. So in light of all of this, what are you most excited about as administrator of NASA? I mean, what, what's there not to be excited about? I'll tell you, coming up, we're sending American astronauts around the moon. It's the first time we've done that in a half century. Uh, we just had a, uh, a, a crew in the loop test uh, down at Kennedy Space Center. So we actually took the crew of, uh, of Artemis uh, for Artemis II. We put them in the Orion spacecraft on top of the SLS vehicle. They were able to do a number of tests, comm checks, ECLIS life support checks. Point is, we're getting ready. The next time we do that test is when uh, Artemis II is going to be out on the pad in just a matter of weeks. 
and we're, we're weeks away, potentially a month or two away at most, from sending American astronauts around the moon again. All right, finally, I got to ask you about something that's been a controversy percolating in Washington and elsewhere for a couple, at least a couple of months now, and that is this Discovery Shuttle controversy and the relocation of that spacecraft. Your thoughts? Okay, this is one, I, and certainly the space community has been following very closely. Well, well first, let's, uh, let's go back to the Working Family Tax Credit Act, um, formerly known as the One Big Beautiful Bill, a massive investment that went into America's human spaceflight program, uh, authorizations through the Artemis V mission, uh, plus up funding for our human spaceflight operations at the International Space Station. And then there was also an allocation uh, to return a, um, a historic spacecraft to Johnson Space Center in Houston, that's our Human Space Flight Center of Excellence in, in Texas. Um, my predecessor has already selected a, um, a vehicle, the former acting administrator. My job now is to make sure that we can do, we can, we can undertake such a transportation within the, uh, within the budget dollars that we have available. And, and of course, most importantly, ensuring the safety of the vehicle. And if we can't do that, you know what? We've got spacecraft that are going around the moon with Artemis two, three, four, and five. One way or another, we're gonna make sure the Johnson Space Center gets their historic spacecraft right where it belongs.